Hi everyone. Uh, I'm not Mark Geiger. Uh, my name is Nick O'Byrne and I'm the programmer for Big Sound for those of you that I haven't met, but I'm sure I've met a lot of you. Um, it really gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark to you all. We're, um, we're very, very lucky to have him here. He's actually flying off to Berlin in a couple of hours, so that is a 14-hour flight to Australia for, to be here for two days and deliver this talk and 24 hours off to Berlin. So very happy he could fit us into his schedule. Um, I just want to tell you a couple of quick things um, about some changes to the program tomorrow. Um, so first of all, there, there's a small change to the conference. Uh, the Growing Your Audience with Community Radio panel uh, has been swapped with the Safe Spaces panel. So that means the Community Radio panel is at 2.05 p.m. Uh, in the music rehearsal room, and the Safe Spaces panel is at 3.45 p.m. in the music rehearsal room. Um, also, tomorrow night in the Big Sound Live program, Machine Age will replace R.W. Grace at the Bright Side, and Kingfisher will replace Avalanche City at Black Bear Lodge. Um, oh, that's a <laughs> classic. We were testing this for ages earlier. I might need an AV guy. I really hope this works. I hope there's someone up there that can test it later. Anyway, um, so Mark is a legendary head of William Morris Endeavour's music division. His clients include Jack White, David Byrne, Janelle Monet, Rihanna, Tom Petty, and the Pixies. But it's his unparalleled understanding of the global, global live music industry, combined with his knowledge on, of the history and the future of digital media, uh, which makes him one of the most influential agents in world music. Uh, he's been listed again and again in uh, Billboard's list of the most influential people um, going around in our industry, and we're very, very happy to have him. So please welcome Mark Geiger. Good day, everybody. Let's see if this clicker is going to work. All the testing in the world. Yes! All right, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Who am I? Uh, I'm a nice boy from the East Coast who's lucky enough to work in the music business for a long time. I'll tell you a little story. When I was 19 years old, I was going to college in San Diego, and uh, I ran the campus record store, and I put on the shows there, and also ran the radio station. And one of the biggest selling imports in the vinyl record store that we carried, which is called the Sort of Vinyl, was the Church, the Blurred Crusade. And uh, Seance came out, and on the back of the record, it said, Management, Michael Chug. And I decided to track him down and rang him up and said, Hey, I love your band. And I'm 19 years old. Can I manage him? And he said, Sure, mate. <laughs> and uh, ended up getting him a record deal. They went on to whatever, I managed them for a bunch of time, then I became their agent. But just so you know, I, I'm a huge fan of, of music, I'm a music freak, I'm actually a technology freak, but I was an Australian music freak. So I worked with, in my early career in the 80s, the go-betweens, the Triffids, Not Drowning Waving, David Bridie, Ed Cooper, uh, Sea Story, Sunglass, Straight Jacket Fits, many, many, many others, even said Bumblebees, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, and we represent a lot of artists, obviously, today. So I'm thrilled to be here because I love Australia, and I've always loved Australian music and bands, and I think uh, one of the things I'll talk about is the difference today from when I was working with them in the beginning. So now I run WME for the world, or the, the music area. I do a lot in digital because I'm a bit of a techie freak, and uh, I'll get into it today. But right now is a really, really cool time to be in this business. And I think it's fantastic. Well, you'll see in a minute. Okay. Yes. Why Australia? Because it's nice. No. Um, before the internet really hit, and everything we do about consuming music, which is different today than it was many years ago, there was this really weird prejudice. It was sort of an overhang. And uh, obviously you had record companies deciding if they would license something, not license something when it came out of here or, or New Zealand or what have you. And what was really weird, and the same happened in Canada, is if you were in the States or the UK, 
and an Aussie band came out and they were great or a singer-songwriter, they almost had the flag over their head. And it gave people a weird license to pr be prejudiced against the artist. And it really pissed me off because obviously I was a fan of a number of the artists and I couldn't figure out why. And uh, I knew it wasn't the cost, I knew bands could travel or whatever, but the music press, radio, labels, they had this real prejudice. And in the advent of what's going on right now digitally, where, and I'll tell you, a long time ago I saw a cartoon of a dog sitting behind the computer, and the cartoon said, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. So, on the internet, nobody knows where you're from as an artist either, because you get hit with the content first, and there's not that many labels, there's plenty of labels and they're very important, but they're not necessarily making the decision before the consumers do, so the overhang's kind of gone. So why Australia part one and why it's reinvigorating to get involved again here, it's because the overhang's gone. So you're not fighting against that on a global basis. Music has always been great here, you know, just like everywhere else in the mid-90s, late-90s, maybe went through a bit of a wobble and not, not a great quality time, but uh, right now it's vibrant as hell and there's more Aussie and acts from this region um, happening around the world than I've seen in a long time. Why else? So we just bought Artist Voice, uh, WME. Um, I love Brett and his team. I think they're superstars and really excited. But I think because of all that and, and what we're trying to achieve globally, um, it's time to get very active and not just be the guys in the States or in the UK or wherever else and really focus on being truly global because everything in my life is truly global. Um, with the advent of the internet, and I'll talk a lot about that, you either get massive global or you get kind of hyper local. The middle's kind of a little bit squashed. And as you all know, because you all use YouTube, Google, SoundCloud, etc., cetera, um, Spotify, Apple Music, blah, 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 and we'll talk a bunch about that. Um, these are global platforms, and the only things that hold them up is some crazy old licensing things that they can't get enough rights to launch a service. But once they go through that, um, you're connected um, to, the, to the world in a new way that never really happened before. So for businesses to not be structured the same way, in my opinion, is lunacy. Um, so there you go, that's why part two. Asia, so when we look at the world a bit from our perspective, we look at it for artists and, and other things and we think, okay, how do we make sure that they, the demand that's now being carried by YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, etc. how do we get the artist to go where the demand is? Because now you can kind of see where the fans are really at. It used to be, I'll tell you a little story, it used to be that the way you could tell where an artist was big or popular was if you got a record royalty statement. So I had a couple of artists, Incubus and the Pixies, and both managers and I are very close, and we, we started to see a little bit of Facebook activity um, for the artist, a little bit abnormal coming out of Chile, which is not in Asia in case you weren't sure. Um, and it was about 100 messages each, and I called the manager, I said, uh, after they called me, I said, what's the royalty statement say? And they said, hmm, let me go get it. They called the record company. They finally got a South American royalty statement. And the royalty showed under 200 units sold for the whole continent. That's number one. When they finally requested the breakdown by territory, I think Chile had about 20 sales on the Pixies and maybe it was 40 on Incubus. And I called a couple of promoters down there at the time and I said, we're getting a lot of Facebook activity down there. What, what's up? He said, no, 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 they're good here. And now remember, I wouldn't have called because nobody would... How do you know that they're big there? So we called and he said, I said, how big? He said, I think we can play the arena. I'm like, what? The arena, it's 40 records sold. Anyway, did the deal, put the show on sale, 13,000 seats sold out in 20 minutes. We're like, what the? Um, so we add a second night, blows out in 30 minutes. So now we got two shows, this is for Incubus, sold out in the arena, 26,000 people. They can't do that in their home market of LA. So it was the beginning of, hey, we don't know what the hell we're doing, uh, anybody anymore, and the metrics have gone absolutely berserk. The information's bad, everything's bad. So a couple things I'm gonna point out because it'll be relevant in the speech and I'll tie it back to Asia, because I know you're all saying, Mark, the slide says Asia, you idiot. Say, talk about it. But anyway, um, we're in this weird time right now when the numbers that we're all seeing are not like the numbers we all grew up with. 
all right? So if you read recently, they said, and I'm a freedom fighter for subscriptions, just so you guys know. I'm a huge believer in Spotify. I've been not just Spotify, the model. And I've been dealing with it for about 20, 25 years, believe it or not. It's been a long slog. Um, but the numbers of consumption are really dramatically different right now. So they just released a figure that said there was one trillion songs streamed in the first six months of this year, which is kind of absurd. I was at home, and I was with my girlfriend, and we were... I was going through some emails and charts and what have you, and we had it that week, we were lucky, we had the number one, two, four record. And the number two record had 65,000 sales in the US. And she said, hey, what's their song like? So I punched it up on YouTube and start to click the video. And of course, the next video says 548 million views. So she says to me, so let me get this straight. 65,000 is the number that counts? And 548 million is the number that Nobody's looking at, what's, what's wrong with you people? And I said, a lot. <laughs> um, so we're in a time now where all of that is going on. And finally, hopefully, the labels believe in the copyright holders that streaming and subscription is the right model and they'll stop fighting. And part of that is Asia, which is really a tricky territory, you know, you say Asia, but the truth is it's a lot of different territories with a lot of different cultures and a lot of different languages. And frankly, been one of the toughest markets from a indigenous music versus Western music, let's call it, all right? To really read and get into, forgetting the language barriers and everything else. There's also a little thing called overwater travel when you're an artist, which increases the cost of going there and working it probably by tenfold. I mean, we had Lady Gaga trying to tour there a couple of years ago. She had a massive production. There was four 747s. I remember talking to Arthur Fogles, the head of Live Nation Global Touring. Hey, I want to add Malaysia, and I want to do this, and I want to go this. He says, um, Mark, to get from the Philippines to wherever it was, Bangkok, it's uh, $1.8 million in freight. So I was like, uh, I guess we're not going. So... Right now, we feel that Asia is at the beginning of a tipping point. And a lot of people who worked here in Australia because of the proximity felt pretty good about making inroads into Asia. Live Nations in China, AEGs in China. You know, there starts to be an aggregated promoters and buyers. But the truth is there's still very little infrastructure. Some cities, very modern cities, Hong Kong, Singapore, others have clubs, theaters, boutique festivals, an arena, you know, Hong Kong doesn't even have an arena, really, it's a convention center. And um, the truth is, is that I think we look at it as a 25 year evolution, but we're just starting to get into it and I'm trying not to make the mistake I made with digital music when we were launching subscription in 1998. I think um, my mother even said to me, son, it was a good effort, but you know, it might be a good idea if you don't wait at the bus stop for 15 years next time. And I said, oh shit, you're right. Anyway, so that's Asia. We're at the start, you know, I don't want to wait at the bus stop, but we're going to start to make investments. So the world, um, I don't know why I created this slide, but I'll talk about it in a second. I think the biggest thing we're not looking at is that consumers all over the world are actually, and I started to say this, consuming content from all over the world is borderless. Transactions, transactions are borderless. Fans are borderless. And we're just starting to track down where demand is actually happening. And so for our business, which is pretty big, but you know, I'll give you a size of it for a minute. We have 2,400 artists. We do, I think, about 35 to 40,000 gigs a year um, in multiple, obviously, different genres. We've got about 450 total employees in the, in the division. And it used to be very North American, European-centric. And because of the way the demand curve is sort of laying out, we're starting to invest. And I think, I try to tell my team to think about it not from our point of view, which, you know, when you're in the US and you have people like Donald Trump running for president, you're half embarrassed and half proud, not of Trump. Um, but I said, you know, every manager in the world, as far as I can tell, in a perfect world has a lot to do, but they like to come into companies like us or a label. They want to go to some person and they want that person to say, I love your band. They're amazing. I believe in them. And then they really want you to reach under your desk, push a button, and make it big in the world all at once. That's really what everybody's dream is. 
So keeping that in mind, we're hoping that while we don't have magic buttons, at least we'll have teams like major labels did, because remember, no agency, um, no promoter, no agency was global ever before. Live Nation's on the hunt. They've just got Germany down. They're still not in France. They're still not in South America. Um, and we're doing the same, and we're trying to get to a network, right? I mean, that's, you would be bummed out if you couldn't get a website um, in, with, in some country because they didn't have a server or a network. Um, and one of the things I'm hyper-conscious of is content has to travel freely, um, as do artists. One of my favorite content producers is the BBC. I don't know if you've watched some of their brilliant documentaries and over the years. And they were one of the first ones to put out a really, really cool web app called the BBC iPlayer. It's fantastic if you're in England. Um, if you're not in England and they air the super amazing David Bowie documentary, you can't see it. So part of what we're conscious of is making sure or trying to make sure that no matter where you are, where you're traveling, that all the content and everything in the way you normally you know, consume when you're home is available. And we have to do that. So that's why we're really focused on where the world is now, not because uh, somebody sent me a letter. EDM. So, you know, over the last few years, we're really, we got lucky. I've been working with dance music since the 80s, signed bands like, or had New Order, Happy Mondays, Guy Called Gerald, 808 State, Chemical Brothers, Groove Armada, Basement Jacks, Fatboy Slim, blah, blah, blah. Um, Moby, Crystal Method, and we're in all the different areas and genres. And when dance music really started to take off, I guess in the mid-2000s, people would say, oh, it's a fad, there's no performers, especially the rock community, they hated it, right? And um, over the years, people say, you know, EDM's a fad, it's going to die out. EDM's a fad, it's going to die out. And I thought to myself, God, I've watched it go from happy hardcore to trip hop to whatever it is. And, you know, every 8 BPM shifted. It was a new genre, so it was kind of like a Monty Python Confuse a Cat episode. But um, I'll bring up Python later in a minute because my entire training of Australia before I got here and started working was from Eric Idle, so I apologize in advance. Um, but I told our team EDM is more like hip hop because when hip hop was happening in America and not in England, when the kids in England were taking ecstasy and the kids in America were carrying guns, um, God, no laugh, I suck. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I said, you know, EDM, we can't, you can't kind of, and I'm sorry to even call it EDM dance music, please don't think of these artists not as artists. Please don't think of this music as invalid. Please don't think because they don't necessarily make album formats um, or necessarily have a guitar player or necessarily have the best formed image um, that it's anything but. And, you know, when we were signing all the indie and cool alternative bands, we were, I was watching them since about 1975, 76. They finally broke and they stopped playing hair bands on MTV in America in 92. And that was after the first Lala in 91. And I thought 75 to 92, 17 year gestation cycle. And that's the cure and Depeche Mode and Joy Division. Everybody else trying to kick the wall down until, you know, arguably Nirvana, Jane's Addiction and others kicked it down. And we're in the world kind of we are today musically where we're not forced to absorb Warrant, Winger and White Snake. Anyway, that's my mini philosophy on EDM. So there, don't ask me to dance. Um, digital versus IRL, I've had to ask three times what IRL is and I now realize it's in real life. Um, we actually have a property called In Real Life, which is a YouTube kind of fan fest. Um, but it's a fascinating world because they're colliding, right? For years I watched companies like Concert TV, I think there was one here called Moshcam, uh, try to take what we do as a live business or what everybody does as a live business, put it on the internet and say there's going to be demand, right? And so I've had friends do it from Digital Club Network and House of Blues Live and Yahoo streaming concerts and working with YouTube directly and all kinds of things. And I think people actually think people sit in front of a computer or their phone and watch a show for 60 minutes. Any, am I wrong that no one does that? And uh, I tried to explain there's absolutely no demand that I've seen, I think the festivals have demand at some times, Coachella, maybe Glastonbury, but most, and, and that's you know, typically a pretty bored consumer who couldn't get a ticket, but 
I think the world is, they're both winning, but they're not cannibalizing each other. And we're seeing it more and more and more. In fact, and the record companies really kind of messed this up, um, they saw digital as the end to their business model, which we'll talk about in a, in a slide or two. And I saw the great Napster free music peer-to-peer -peer as the greatest free drug revolution in history to get everybody hooked and it saved the record labels and publishers billions in R&D. You know, when you usually transition from one system to another, it costs a lot of money. It costs billions of investment. Here they just basically gave everybody free music for a while, allowed them to take it. Yeah, they sued a few people we'll talk about. It. Yeah, they put roadblocks and obstacles in the way. But what really happened is we ended up with an economy of billions of people who were comfortable pointing, clicking, and absorbing. As bad as it was, you know, when they were saying everybody, all of you were, or me, who were pirates back in the day, I said, okay, let me get this straight. You're telling me the average consumer spends about 60 bucks a year buying CDs, which wasn't very much if you think about it. And that the pirates who are stealing all of your music just bought a $250 in the 90s, $250 CD burner, a $300 or $400, and again, it was huge at 50 megabytes, uh, hard drive for storage. They had to buy blank disks if they were going to burn them and rip. And then they had to have a T1 line or some crazy expensive bandwidth because if, I don't know if you know, but this was in the era of 28K baud modems, 56K, etc. until you finally got a T1 or a DSL line and you could suck down a song in less than a day. Um, and then people would go, I got 30,000 songs. Not really, they couldn't do it. The hard drives weren't big enough. I got 10,000 songs on my hard drive. And I would go to the presence of the label and I'd say, look, guys, let me understand this. My iPod holds 120 megabytes of music. If I fill it up with the way that I want to legally, it's going to cost me $10,000 in iTunes money. I mean, seriously, this doesn't make a lot of sense. So. If you think back, this was maybe the most tortured transition in history of businesses. I mean, I think if you go back to uh, when people went from trains to automobiles, maybe it was close. Um, but the digitization of our industry has had the consumers in front of the industry for about 20 plus years now, and it was because of that quote unquote piracy revolution. And I call it a positive revolution, because everybody's here now, and now that if it was a club, everybody's in the club for a while, and now you're going to say, hey, you've been in the club for a while. Pay your 10 bucks a month, you can keep coming. Anyway, that's that. Okay, the future. Um, for some reason, I had a company called Artist Direct. It was really, really big at the time, pretty influential. We were really the, one of the first people to build official websites and email lists and do e-commerce from the artist. It got really big. Um, we were lucky enough to work with big artists who were great, try to teach them about the internet, what have you. And after failing miserably and losing $65 million and taking my company public the week the market crashed, people now ask me about the future. And I thought, geez, um, might ask a winner, but anyway. Uh, the good news is people thought that what we were doing was right. And so instead of making the money, I ended up telling stories about what I thought was happening in the music business. And for some reason, people believed me. Um, but uh, I have a pretty good track record. So I think I'm gonna share with all of you my latest because for some other horrible reason, I enjoy public speaking and I know this is like painful to anybody here because it's the number one fear, but I kinda like it and I like show, doing things. So I wrote all of you a little bit of a presentation. I did one about a year and a half ago at MEDEM and it went over pretty big because I basically started with files suck and they're dead. And the good news for me was two weeks later, Billboard released an article on the cover and they said, Mark's right, files suck and they're dead and they're down 20% so far this year in consumption. So I'm gonna try and keep my streak going here, all right? And because I'm a boring American guy, um, I decided not to do my typical PowerPoint, you know, bullet point, da da da. And I thought, you know what, I'm going all the way to that side of the world. I'm gonna write it with a bit of a, and I know it's New Zealand people, uh, Lord of the Rings metaphor, it was actually originally uh, England. So I hope you're okay with this, and I hope you think it's a little bit fun, because I do. Anyway, and I'm gonna put on character. I was gonna use a stage prop, but my PR department told me no, because somebody take a picture and then make me look stupid. <laughs> anyway, in the beginning, 
There were physical formats, and everybody was happy. And then the internet came, and the music hungry and unsatisfied said, I want my music on my computer, damn it. And so the crumbling of the industry began, and the war took all the money and all their property, except for the live shows, by the way. That's why I went to, to the agency business. Digital music starvation then came about in the mid-90s when unsatisfied music fans wanted more music at much cheaper prices through the net. To get their music, these music hungry had to fight through nasty file sizes, slow ripping with CD burners. How's my vocal inflection, okay? Um, expensive hard drive upgrades, terrible bandwidth, and death by stealing, if you remember the lawsuits. And then came more plagues of digital rights management. Napster, mp3.com, peer-to-peer services, bad interfaces, larger file sizes, because, you know, Neil Young has to have a full Pono, so whatever, anyway. I love him, but not that one. Uh, more slow bandwidth, high-priced files, label and publisher wars, lawsuits, major label consolidation, copyright infringement. I have a great job, don't I? Um, incomplete libraries and confusion, confusion, confusion just to get where we currently are in our story. So we begin chapter 14 of the great war of digital music called The Giants Save the Day. Order is restored and the world shuts up and watches. Anyway, on the left-hand side are the reigning champions, all of which have about 100 million to a billion consumers registered. I'm sure you know most of them. If you don't, I'm sure you will. Some of them are in the game, some of them are not in the game. iHeartMedia's clear channel in America, so it's the, you know, imagine all the radio stations collected, um, sort of put all the Aussie radio stations together, be like that. And on the right are the smaller roles of the outsiders that are trying to be contenders. There are more than this, but these are the ones that I could remember um, and I thought might matter. As we enter this 21st year of the war, storm clouds brew over the landscape as the giants trudge onto the field. They bring with them other services and armies of TV, video, film, video games, books, and more. More, creating the further blended subscription offerings and hard to understand pricing. Amazon Prime, Google Play, you'll see a lot of it down here when they get all the licensing stuff together. They also bring a host of other businesses which make this war seem quite petite of music and insignificant to the giants, while millions of music hungry stare at the music equivalents of Godzilla, King Kong, and Mothra. I know that's an old reference, please somebody remember that. Um, hoping they give a damn and make a good product, which Apple Music version one was not, sorry. Um, one thing is for certain, for both consumers and content suppliers, confusion runs amok. So this battle, all right, to fix our industry and do things is over who has the true power to scale users. So using their weaponry of a hundred million, I remember the numbers I talked about it, to one billion plus audiences. Let me stop that for a minute. I had to go, unfortunately, the Video Music Awards a couple weeks ago before I came here. Did anybody get a chance to see it? Awful. But that being said, um, there's one thing I took out of it. Taylor Swift came on to accept her award for a video of the minute, whatever it was, and she said, I just want to thank all my fans. She's, I just want to thank, she's really big, um, all of my fans for watching this video a billion times. And I said, that wouldn't have happened 15, 20 years ago, right? Anyway, billion plus audiences, internal payment systems, and blended billing. The Giants hope to convert their loyal minions to pay fees for a variety of content services. So really what I'm saying is the head fake of Spotify and everything else is we all think they're gonna be music um, only, or we hope they are. Netflix might only be film and video. But you know, there was a really, really great CEO. He, was, he ran uh, the equivalent of Telstra. It's called Mike Armstrong of AT&T. And he, he bought a cable company because he said, hey, to his board, listen, the future, and AT&T was the biggest home phone, you know, cord, dial um, company in North America. And he said, look, I'm pretty sure that in a few years, they're going to talk, I'm going to have to bring cell service, data service, cable, satellite, whatever, on the same bill, and it's going to be a blended, blended billing. And his board said, wrong, you're fired. 
and uh, he was obviously right. So anyway, I think that's what's going to happen here. I think we're all going to get into really robust and hopefully good digital music services and right six month mark, one year mark, we're gonna start getting those annoying advertisings, advertisements that switch over your video from Apple TV, join whatever, and we're gonna get into this whole blended um, subscription model, which really confusing to me is Amazon because they really charge you for shipping and I don't think anybody knows you get content with your expedited shipping. Anyway, here's a snapshot of what's still to be figured out over the next few years. Some of this hasn't even begun. Can you all read? No, I'm just kidding. I can't read it. I'm old. Um, anyway, here's what's still a mess. Content libraries. All right, the licensing is a nightmare. I mean, when you were in the old record business, you might license territorially, regionally, and the owners now or the license, licensees of that content have rights and they all get to decide whether they want to participate in Apple Music, in Spotify, in Amazon, in Netflix, in whatever. And a lot of times they don't. They want to cut deals, they want to hold it up, and that stops the content from getting to all of us or even the services from launching. And that's a real problem um, because the industry at the same time is also really bitching about everybody not paying for them, and I'm not sure why you would pay for them when it's on YouTube and not on Spotify, right, or whatever it is. Um, pricing, everybody's still giving the entire library of music for the last 50 years away for free because they're scared you won't pay for it. I'm like, that's a pretty good deal. I pay 180 bucks for my cable. I don't even watch the TV. It's terrible. 10 bucks for all the music in the world and we're scared of that? We must not believe in our own business. Um, there's no new release tiers. Obviously, when a movie comes out, they have a new release tier. That's why Taylor Swift held her record off Spotify. She's like, wait, wait, wait. This is not worth the same as that, you know, old... Uh, Saints record, sorry, I just had to pull one out. Saints record from, I love the Saints, so don't take this as anything. Uh, Saints record from back when, one's gonna generate more money, why is it being treated the same? She's not really wrong. Um, so tiering windowing has to get worked out. Metadata, I'm a metadata freak. I like it when uh, I can get artist information wherever I'm at, their discography, reviews, um, similar artists, credits, who produced it, what label. And that's not really in most places. If you ever check iTunes, you know, Steve Jobs hated the labels because they tortured him. And he did something pretty sneaky. I don't know if you guys ever noticed. You ever go into your iTunes control panel and, you know, beats per minute, last played, last skipped? You ever see a field for record label? So if you're an XL fan, a 4AD fan, a Village Sounds fan, you know, a modular fan, you can't really find by that. I think that's offensive to a music fan, but that's what you know got thrown out when people were fighting and uh, bitching. They were trying to kill each other. But anyway, if you go to Spotify for new releases, you might get 38 classical records before you get to the Drake album, and these things are a mess. Um, I often, I teased the head of Spotify the other day. I said, hey, you know, I was a real Peter Gabriel fan. Let's go online and check out what's there. Uh, I think there was the last temptation of Christ and a bunch of compilations, and that was it. So we got, we got a little bit of work to do. Interfaces, personalized recommendations are just beginning. Even history files, if you go to Apple Music and you want to continue listening to what you listen to, it's sort of not there, you have to go 10 clicks in. You know, um, when we use web browsers, you can hit back, they have history, you, you know, some of these services don't really believe in that yet. Uh, human curation, as opposed to Pandora or whatever, is just sort of beginning. If you look at what Zane Lowe's doing, uh, by leaving the BBC, going to Apple, and what Trent Reznor's doing, and what some of the people who are really music people, a friend of mine at RDO, they're starting to produce some content. I mean, I think they hired all the editors from Pitchfork to put together these playlists, and they're really interesting and different, much like a great radio station is better, a lot of times, than a uh, automated service. So that's just starting. And the two bottom ones are another mess. Um, it's happening globally. The publishers are really fighting the label still for getting paid in the digital world. Uh, more, and the courts are trying to figure out what copyright means, how it works, and how it should get compensated in the digital model. Now, most of these people ha are, you know, elected officials or whatever it is who, I don't know if they've ever listened to music, let alone know how copyright works. So it's a fascinating time. We have a lot to sort out. So, okay, Mark, that's nice. Where's the future, you idiot? Oh, oh okay, sorry, let me talk about it. So combinations for survival are coming. Um, because I'm not sure people will, or companies will survive in a standalone basis. If you're Netflix and you have, I don't know, 90 million paying customers, 
and a great relationship with them, and you're already hitting their credit card, why aren't they in music yet? Because it'd be pretty short to get that consumer over to music, or at least one might think so. So I think in the next five years, what do I really think is going to happen? I think there's going to be mega mergers and what I call filling out platform mergers so that people have video games, they have film, they have TV, they have music in the same services, or there's alliances. You know, I think Pandora has a problem because if you use Pandora and you then go to somebody's house and use Spotify on a Sonos, and then you've got to go backwards and you can't get what you want to get. I'm not a great believer that people go backwards in technology once they have sort of a, a functionality experience, I call it. So let's see what happens to Shazam and how they pull out of just being one thing. I want to see how Pandora and what happens when inside of Spotify, inside of RDO Rhapsody, Deezer, whatever service you care about and use or YouTube launches, when they build autoplay and you click when you're on an artist and it basically builds your church radio station on the fly, and now it's a competitor of Pandora, how they're going to survive. So I think that's a big wave of what's going to come. Another big wave of what I think everybody can, can expect is, if anybody here is a manager, which I know a lot of you are, um, I think you all know that you don't get paid what you think your contract says you should get paid. All right? And in a digital world, it's pretty easy. In the analog world, it's easier to hide figures. In a digital world, everything is a log file usage. And companies are going to have to, well, if I can track it on, on Microsoft Excel on my computer when I suck in a file of a royalty statement, the artist can too. So there's a movement happening that's starting to get very loud and the drums are beating. And it's what I call the e-tradization of the business or the flattening of collections. Because the companies that collected the money uh, I don't know what they are here, so my bad, I apologize, but they're performing rights organizations and they collect rights of all time, all, all different kinds. And there's new rights. Neighboring rights are fairly new. Frankly, we're in an era where every time you watch a video on YouTube, there's an ad that usually plays. And unlike radio in the past, unlike television in the past, who kept the advertising revenue, this is a 50-50 split thereabouts, 45-50, whatever, with the copyright holders, so that's a collection business. Anyway, you know, probably about 50% of the money somehow miraculously disappears between the sales and ultimately paying the artists. And I think that entire system is gonna go like this. In the banking world, when you had the big banks, Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, they kind of got wiped out, just like some of the consumer banks did when they introduced ATM machines. Um, when E-Trade, E-Schwab, TD Ameritrade, and I don't, again, don't know exactly which ones are here, uh, came and they put the power on your desktop at the hands of a computer. And if you wanted to execute a stock trade, it might cost 300 bucks, but it was 9.99 over here, and you could see it in real time and you could control it. I think the same thing is about to happen in the music business in terms of collections. So a lot more money, if we're right about subscription, is gonna finally trickle through and be tracked. So I think that's a big one. Um, I'm personally very bullish on this because it's been tough for artists, managers, and others to survive as the transition went from CD to file and now from file to stream and the model's changing. So it'll be a welcome relief to get the collection sorted out. Um, another thing is that most of what's happened in technology has happened by technologists. And I'm not really talking about my wannabe technology background. Um, I'm talking about Daniel Eck or a myriad of other entrepreneurs, um, Alex Young, who does uh, SoundCloud, who come really, they're music fans, but they come really from a pure, straight out of college coding background or some entrepreneurial, other entrepreneurial background, but they're not really, they don't really understand the culture of music. You know, people in this room probably understand the culture of music. Probably not everybody's 100% clued into the culture of technology. And that's been a bit of a clash for a while. Um, so one of the things we're starting to see is that the actual content and people that are in the entertainment businesses and do it for a living and really focus on shows, artists, records, anything in, in that world are starting to be in these services, and I call it the super player draft. And, and the reason is, it's like watching the AFL down here or rugby league without any rugby players who have played before, right? It's not that great. Um, Apple sort of seemed to start 
the game off and get it right. Um, my buddy Zane Lowe and Trent Reznor are there, and they're, they're really good and really smart, especially Trent at this stuff. He's incredible. Uh, Jimmy Iovine, who is a big player, ran Interscope. They're now inside of Apple. And so I kind of expect, forget the first version of Apple Music, I kind of expect that the content experiences and the curation and other things will be better because it's a combination between the tech teams and the music teams. And I think we're going to see this throughout. You know, I know the people at Amazon. I know the people at Google. I know the people at YouTube. Uh, it would be very hard to have a discussion about music with them or anything about music other than how much they're paying to the labels. So I think that's going to come too. And so if you add these three things up, it basically says we're not close. It says there's still a bunch of things to go as much as we're all power users online and sending emails and other things, click, listen, see, view, whatever, it's still got a ways to go. So, in any case, these giants that we talked about, the contenders, the telephone companies, and other giants are still kind of showing dumb and slow. And they're going into yet another period of unstable and evolving plans. I know this is redundant, I'm sorry. Uh, ensuring more lemming-like behavior from competitors. So a few things for sure. Streaming, all content, maybe not books, has one. Vinyl is the physical preferred format if you're a hard copy type. 10 bucks a month, still a fight. I, I, it's hard for me to believe. I think it's the greatest value proposition of all time. I don't think I'm biased. I think I pay my cable bill and it's the worst value proposition of all time. Uh, windowing and tiering is not started. It's, we're still in the great try it before, before you buy it era. No one, not even me, understands blended offerings yet. I don't even think they do. The industry has no idea where the money is coming, going, or nor do the creators. Big equity and advances. Spotify gave up, you know, if you read the news, Spotify and others, the labels were able to extract equity from them, worth a lot of money, and it stays in what they call the corporate black box. It doesn't really make it all the way down to the artist. There's a lawsuit going on about that. I would uh, read that carefully. Um, but anyway, they are definitely keeping the money and keeping the equity, and it keeps on keeping on. Uh, the flattening or e-tradization of collections has really begun, just at the beginning. The music industry, which obviously hates all of this, or did hate all of it, is starting to not hate all of it. And I think at 100 million paying customers, they really will not hate it. Um, it's funny, I'm, I'm so old that I remember when everybody was screaming when the iTunes was going to kill the business. And when iTunes got to about $8 billion in revenue, the same executives who were, were motherfucking you know, technology and the internet basically turned around and said, this is great, we're going to make a lot of money now. So you know, that, that switches uh, over time and when it hits to a certain level. Apple Music, which I have high hopes for, I think it was a poor launch of version 1.0, but I would tell everybody, software, if you were a tech geek, you never bought the first version. You were always disappointed. Um, you know, I think Microsoft that got Excel got good at version 18 or something, so um, let's just watch it. But there's something really good that happened. Um, there's one worldwide radio station, and I was on vacation in Greece listening to a punk band from England and Zane Lowe broadcast from Los Angeles, and then it went around the globe, New York, London, etc. And I felt this sense of palpable excitement. I know Zane was here a couple weeks ago, that, oh my God, there's actually going to be a world chart. That's kind of wild. How could there not have been one? Oh my God, there's a world radio station where no matter where you are, if you live in a country that's not Australia, not North America, not Europe, well, it could be part of Europe, um, you grew up in Macedonia, you know, Austra who won last night's Aussie football game? The, the, sorry, the soccer game. Australia, phew. Uh, they're playing, I can't pronounce, Tajikistan? Okay. If you grew up there and you're a music freak, your choices are limited. Now you can tune into Beats 1. I think that's important. I think it's a big deal. We all grew up here, somewhere we had Triple J, you had a bunch of stuff. Most of these people, like I said, in Chile, they didn't have the selection we had, not of record stores, not of radio, not of anything. Now they kind of do, or it's starting. So let's expect, I think that's a big deal. I talked about the charts. They're a disaster, they're a mess, they're measuring the wrong thing, but they're also in flux. So they're changing, they're getting, uh, they're going to be really tracked. They won't be estimated. They'll be global, blah, blah, blah. And as I said, a trillion tracks were streamed. So everybody who didn't believe 
that the numbers would come out because you have a tiny price per stream, 0.00012 cents versus whatever you're paid on a CD. You know, in order to make it bigger than the existing industry, the multiplier on the other side had to be big, and at a trillion streams, I think it's starting to get big. So in any case, the next few years will be marked by rapid user growth, refinements of offerings, personalized interfaces, expanding content libraries, confusion and complaining over the money, and lots and lots of action um, from the players above. So there you go. That's my Lord of the Rings speech. Oh, you are too kind. Okay. Um, they are making me take questions. I'm kidding. Um, bring it, people. Oh, you. I know you. Know. Let's hear it. When the data is better and everything is tracked, yep. there's no that invisible misreporting or whatever, does the music get more interesting or more terrible? Okay, so Rick Rubin and I, he's a dear friend of mine, was a partner in my business. Um, I'm lucky to say he's a friend. Uh, get in fights all the time about this. And he said, Geiger, you're wrong. It's all about the music. And I said, Rick, the pricing and distribution is changing. It's always about the music. The music has to be great, otherwise it doesn't matter. And I said to him, actually what's going to happen is because everything is at our fingertips and every bit of music catalog, I mean, look, when I had a record collection, you had a record collection, if you really wanted to hear something we were talking about, hey, remember that record by King Crimson, da 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 and you didn't have it and I didn't have it, we're fucked, all right? Now we can go listen to it. So basically everything's there and everything can be compared to everything else. So my presumption is that music quality in order to compete has to go up, all right? In a world where there's more easily accessed music and more competition. So I actually think the quality bar has got to rise. Now, the market's so big that somebody's like, Geiger, what about YouTube artists? Have you watched that, you know, cat picking its nose? And I said, yeah, it's big. It's got, you know, 100 million views. And uh, cute cat. And basically, we have this vat that's forming, and there's multiple layers, but the layers that I think will be popular and scale and be real will be a, it'll be a tougher market. Um, I think we're also going to be more of a global market than a local market. So, you know, if you're, if you're a band from Brisbane and you're competing and really your dream is to be big in Sydney, Melbourne, you know, play on festivals, blah, 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 you know, headline vivid, whatever it might be, you know, be on laneway. Now everybody is sort of competing in the Spotify library, which is global. I doubt you're gonna be able to find easily, hey, just show me the Australian library. So I think it is that there's more competition, it's gonna be tougher, and the quality goes up. Well, that's true. But built without you know, proper remuneration, I know there are arguments against that, but I'm interested in your version of that argument. Well, I would say this. You know, um, I think Spotify gave a 20% of their equity to the labels. The company's current valuation is $8 billion. Can anybody tell me what 20% of $8 billion is? Oh, I know what it is. It's $1.75 billion. Please correct me if I'm wrong. That's $1.75 billion payable to the labels. So the fact that somebody says they aren't remunerated is Bullshit, okay? It's just different. Um, I think that in startup markets, what everybody wants is for the money to be equal even though there's no users. It's really a different model. We're shifting from, or less users, we're shifting from a high, a very low volume of sales, relative, and a high unit price to a tiny unit price. And that means, and it's not really a unit price, but a unit stream. Um, and that means that that trillion number, or the first multiplier, has to be big. You know, this, this, nobody would say that if when Napster had 90 million users, they actually let it exist, and they figured out how to monetize it and start charging for it. We would be probably in a world that had hundreds of millions of music consumers paying. So I think this was actually caused by the labels, and I think when you stop something, technology especially has a way of going around you, right, and figuring it out. 
And, you know, history's kind of littered with this, uh, of companies that try and protect an old business model, and they screw themselves on the future business model. In, in other talks, I can give you a couple of examples, and one of them I said, you know, the, the trains were approached by all the new auto manufacturers, the train companies, Southern Pacific Railroad was uh, approached by Ford and, uh, for financing and to own them, and they said, why would anybody want to drive in a car? They're tiny, they don't hold as many people, there's no roads, there's no gas stations. It wasn't the best decision, let's say, all right? Um, I know that the telcos, I talked about AT&T, and uh, they made phones that used at home that had cords plugged in the wall or into the phone. And people said, hey, do you want to invest in this phone you can walk around with called a mobile phone? And they said, why would anybody need to walk around and be on their phone? Wasn't the greatest decision. In fact, um, there was a wireless company in the States called Singular, and they end up buying AT&T. So it wasn't really the greatest call. You know, in our era, or at least my era, um, MTV and other music services stream, put videos on the air. And as some of these websites were getting big, people said, look, I don't want to sit through 20 of shitty videos to maybe see one of that I like. I'd like to be able to request it online. And MTV basically said, why would anybody want to do that? Um, we may actually have to pay for the videos if we do that. And what ended up happening is Yahoo came and kind of killed them and ended them. And at least where I was, that was the one of the, and here too, I think, the premier kind of cultural channels. Um, and then YouTube came and finished them off. So I think lots of people make dumb decisions in life. That's my answer. Not yet. I mean, if you read about some of the things that are happening in the Supreme Court and other ways about the free internet, internet, unregulated, whatever, you know, um, I guess when we just started to have cell phones that had text or, or when cell phones started to get big, you know, they charged you every call, right, and every text. And, you know, these companies make commercials and I know people would not want you to call them because it would charge money, you know? And that was a phase, that was a period of time. And then the first company came up with, you know, your 500 minute plan for some flat amount and people started to use cell phones more. And, I, and then when text came, it the same thing happened. In fact, I travel here from the, sta from the States and I've gotten, I don't know, 70 messages from Verizon that I'm over my data allowance because I sent a picture of myself in a koala to my kids and I'm like now screwed. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I am a tourist. Um, but I think these things take care of themselves over time. So the, you know, you don't have real scale in these services yet. And I think that what will happen is there will become, because everybody wants to make money, right? You got a, somebody renting a pipe. And, uh, and this is what I joke about Neil Young and Pono. When you put bigger data through the pipe, it takes up more of the pipe. And so the pipe companies want to charge you more. Um, right now, we're not being charged. You know, I may listen to a hundred times more music than you, as an example, and my data charges don't really reflect it. They may go up a little bit. Um, and Wi-Fi, they don't go up at all. If it's through the, you know, whatever LTE service or 4G, it goes up. So I think this will get solved over time, and I think some monies will have to go towards the, towards the telcos. But you know, the telcos are pretty big, and they're pretty wealthy and they are, have a lock on this stuff. And they don't just care about music either because anybody who uses data, voice, text, video, I mean, they like video much more than music because it's fatter, you know? Um, but it's gonna come and it'll get rationalized and there'll be bundled plans and people will pay people and we won't see it, but it's gonna happen. I think I see you. Yes. Yes, sir. Neil Young. Neil Young, sorry. Sorry. Uh, the, the argument is obvious. You know, when in my era, you know, they bought mobile sound fidelity vinyl, 
and they had gold CDs, and you know, people spent a lot of money on stereos. And, but you know, I'm, I try to be a pragmatist. Um, I try. And I think we've been in a backwards fidelity revolution for a long time, right? Our headphones went from whatever to white earbuds. Um, the speakers that used to power our home stereo turned into computer speakers. So uh, the files, most people didn't look at how big they were. Most of them were 128K, and they were ripped at a very poor uh, rate. So Neil Young and other artists are totally right. Um, it's not fair that their music sounds so good in the studio and in the mastering lab, and then by the time it gets to the consumer, uh, it sounds a lot shittier, and there's you know, degradation of the files and all kinds of stuff. But I'm also not a fan of stamping my feet when a billion, two billion, five billion people are doing it a certain way. That's why I say I'm a pragmatist. And I think what happens is in order, because the pipes are small, and you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a, a wave file, how big it is, regular to a, a 328K or 320K uh, file, but it's about 10 times bigger. So no matter what you're doing, if a, if a actual song that's full audio fidelity has, is 85 megabytes, the time of download, the ability to stream, and everything else is, uh, is kind of compromised. And Neil Young, you know, he launched a separate Toblerone, and um, if you've seen it, it's a Toblerone. It's a big one, though. It's like the kind you buy in the airports. And uh, basically, it's a hard drive for files. And, you know, the thing for me is I think files are dead or dying. So I'm, I, I wouldn't do that. But I do think, of course, he has an argument. But when the pipes get big and compression, if you've ever watched Silicon Valley, it's all about compression, um, we'll get to a higher fidelity place, right? Um, lots of companies are working on it. It's just we're trying to get the scale. And sometimes, you know, in some of these places, getting quality line into your house or your car or the bandwidth is very much compromised. So I don't think it's practical yet. I think it's more important to get people listening to music, um, even if in a lot of it's inaudible, but some of it isn't, uh, and using habits and, frankly, paying for it, and over time. And one of the tears I was really excited about was when Deezer and Tidal, the massive success that it is not, um, offering, are offering high-res files. But, you know, most of my friends don't really know that you can actually save the files to your phone, and there's a thing called offline mode. So I would say there's just a little bit of work to do before we get there. That's my two cents. But I'm all about Neil Young. I love him. I'm all about better quality audio. But I'm really all about everybody having music and learning how to use these platforms and enjoy them and ultimately pay for them. And then the quality can go up. Because, you know, when I grew up, I didn't have a Nakamichi Dragon tape deck. I didn't have the high-end dual turntable. I didn't have my clip speakers until I got older, so I don't know what the fuck everybody's talking about. There's my answer. <laughs> I'm out of here if no more questions. Uh, I, who? Okay, can't see. Sorry, there's lights here that are very blinding. Yes, sir. Uh, do you think globalization is the new industry? Or is it uh, no, not at all. You know. I think globalization was predicted in all the Thomas Friedman books, blah, blah. No, I actually think, um, you know, I travel a lot. So I'm kind of glad when my plugs work at a hotel. Uh, I'm kind of glad when I can drink the water and not get sick when I go to Mexico. Um, I think most things, most consumers want to have a standard of. And then there's localization that takes place everywhere. You know, one of the things that I was really happy about when I went to Sydney was I didn't see Burger Kings and Taco Bells and McDonald's everywhere. They were kind of buried. There wasn't that many of them. I was stunned and happy. I did see Hungry Jack, so I learned that. Um, but I think that, you know, cultural... I think that cultural non-homogeneity, if that's the right way to say the word, is also passed through the internet as well as globalization. So when we go online and we want to research Tasmania, I can go past the encyclopedia now, and I can find out everything. So I actually think the culture and the traditions can get more spread easily, actually. And I think they can be strengthened, and I think they can be efficient. So as I said before, I th really think we're in a global market, which is great, but it's also in a hyper-local market. So I think it's both at the same time. I think the middle is a challenge. 
You know, as you see with the European Union, I was vacationing in Greece when the Greek crisis was going on. I was there to try to solve it. I had no impact. Um, my jokes are sucking. <laughs> but um, I think it was interesting to see in Europe, out of Europe, blah, blah. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I was on the island of Santorini, and I was looking. There's a few flags, you know, Greece this, Greece that. And I talked to a bunch of locals. And <laughs> they said something funny because, you know, we were, I was reading everything and Greece going to exit the Euro and the Eurozone and da 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 da. And I thought, I got to go talk to these people. And they said to me, listen, dude, we say dude in California. Um, we've been here 3,600 years. We've been ruled by the Mesopotamians, the Polyponesians, the Turks, the Venetians, and Greece came to existence in 1950. We'll be fine. And I thought, okay, I get that. But I do think it's a long way of saying that, you know, there's a struggle maybe in the middle, but there's not a struggle and, uh, at the local level. And in fact, Australia, which, you know, is pretty near and dear to my heart, both musically, people, love the culture, et cetera, et cetera, feels like more people are traveling and more of the culture is being exported than ever before. So I kind of like what's going on. All right. Oh, oh good. Yes, sir. I think or may, I can't see shit, so I apologize. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are with the streaming services and music that's in the public domain. Um, meaning older music that's available. Yeah, that's like Happy birthday and all the old stuff. I, I think part of it was they were trying to extend copyright to the, some of the people because I think it had a 99 year. And I don't know what it's like here, 99 year uh, expiration, it goes into the public domain. So I think there were some tweaks on that. Um, I'm not sure really. I think, I think those songs are, or whatever it was that was in public domain, classical music, what have you, is, is I, you know what, I'm not sure, I haven't given too much thought. It's good it's out there, but I, I don't wanna, I'm not gonna be good at that answer. I have to give it a little bit of thought. Sorry, I know I'm a letdown. How are we doing time-wise? Finish? Finish? All right, thanks, everybody.